utility of octa in this thing so octa has been developed as a substitute to ffa and uh, uh, it, it was uh, uh, it was always thought that ffa had a uh, one of the serious side effects uh, though it was rare but uh, it, it has been developed and it has come up uh, to substitute the ffa and uh, straight going to my uh, uh, the topic there so if you, if if you think uh, talk about the indications of doing ffa in diabetic retinopathy are very clear we uh, normally follow the guidelines given by the you know american academy or some uh, uh, private uh, some, some some preferred practice patterns so this is the main indication that remain if you want to treat the csme that is the main indication or would want to evaluate the visual loss or we want to uh, uh, know whether there are any obscure or suspected uh, uh, retinal revascularization that those are the only indication where we are doing fundus fluorescein angiography nowadays now i'll show that where the octa comes into a uh, role uh, when we talk about doing a laser for csme yes we are doing uh, a laser in few cases of csme like uh, uh, non central involving where the vision is uh, worse than 2030 and this is how a uh, 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 fundus fluorescein angiography at the top look like and how the scp and dcp uh, the deep cap capillary plexus of the octa will look like so on octa the if micro aneurysms are seen it has to be seen in the deep capillary plexus and they are not clearly visible and those are the areas which we treat for in cases of uh, uh, macular photocoagulation so uh, uh, so eventually uh, if we are not able to the, see the micro aneurysms clearly and especially the leaky micro aneurysms so octa is of no use uh, in, in in cases of csme so these red uh, marks say the macular laser treatment with octa is a distant dream. So it doesn't help us there in our clinical practice there. So what about clinical utility of octa to evaluate unexplained visual loss? Yes, uh, with the without injecting a dye, we can see uh, a capillary non-perfusion or the macular perfusion areas in the macula. So thus saying that yes, the patient has can have a visual loss because of this. And uh, we all know that the superficial capillary plexus and the deep capillary plexus will have different kind of, uh, uh, you know, outcomes and more uh, damage can be seen in uh, deep capillary plexus in this slide. But we all knew that OCT, plain OCT can give this uh, information very well. So we don't need Octa to tell that there is a, uh, what is the reason for an unexplained visual loss. So it may help in evaluating the visual loss, but yes, it is not a definitely, uh, it will, it, it, it cannot replace the uh, simple OCT there. Now the clinical utility of OCTA to find out the NVE or the CNP areas, we all been doing montages or the ETDRS uh, photographs or the wild field to know these. This is how we see these angiograms uh, showing us the, uh, the, the CNP areas and the new vascularization. And this is how uh, uh, Octa will look like. So Octa, this is a 12 by 12 scan. Again, uh, it's, it's, all, uh, it's all machine, which machine you have. And another one of my colleague has given me this Octa where the, they make a montages of the 12 by 12 scan. So nearly it is covering the whole ETDRS field. So it is clearly without injecting, we are able to see CNP areas and the uh, new vascularization in these patients. Yes, Octa helps to pick up new vascularization and CNP areas, but the catch here is, which machine you have right now we don't have ultra feed kind of octa images which we need but yes it it serves our purpose one we once we have treated these patients we want to know any other areas left so uh, we can use octa to see nv and cnp areas now come to the other vascular occlusions the vein occlusions like i mean practically there is no indication for crvo as such uh, for doing an ffa at best, our clinical practice where, where we do in CRBO, if, if, if you have a minimal changes in the eye, you want to know whether what is the time of the vein perfusion, you need FFA for that because that is the only thing which is going to tell you that what time the vein is filling and this is a kind of an impending CRBO or it's a, 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 a before, uh, 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 the only FFA can do that. So Octa cannot do this. So Octa is not useful in, in, in such a situation in case of especially CRVO. And what about BRVO? BRVO we do uh, nowadays the treatment is anti-VEGF, anti anti-VEGF and anti-VEGF. Sometimes we have to do grid lasers if patient uh, uh, refuses to get anti-VEGF. Yes, those patients are there in our poor country. And then we have to do a scatter for NVE. 
So is there any clinical utility of Octa in, in, in these patients? Because earlier we used to get FFA in these patients and look for perfusive macular edema and non-perfusive macular edema. And depending on the vision, we used to uh, treat them. The, this is how the uh, Octa will look like. Uh, see a patient there who already been uh, uh, lasered for a uh, uh, inferior temporal BRVO. So the patient has this kind of a, uh, 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 the, the Octa, uh, the capillary non-perfusion on the OCTA. And uh, this is the OCT patient have. So yes, seeing this OCT A, I, I am able to see, I am able to see the non-perfusion area. So I may plan a laser seeing this OCT A, I may not need uh, 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 FFA there. So this is again uh, a, a, a relatively a fresh BRBO patient. You see that there is a, a disturbance in the capillary scene in the macular area and the, the phase is broken. And you have this kind of a, uh, uh, macular edema, so the patient refuses uh, anti vegf so I can do uh, a la grid laser uh, seeing the uh, the plane, uh, the octa uh, in these patients. So grid treatment based on octa is may be done in case of a, a BRVO. And what about a scatter treatment? Yes, again the the catch here is the what what kind of machine you have. So if you have a machine which 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 gives you a you know, a, a good 12 by 12 uh, mm uh, uh, scan and a very, very cooperative patient so that the artifacts are not there. You can pick uh, these capillary non-perfusion areas and uh, the areas of NVE. So this patient has already been treated with the, you can see the laser marks above, but uh, three months later, uh, the, we can see the NVE. So we thought that, uh, is there any area we can retreat? So this is the area uh, we can retreat based on the octa. But again, I said the catch is the technology and the uh, UVF will be uh, better. What about arterial occlusion? It will not show you, uh, detect the delay in the perfusion. But yes, the scans look good. Just to say that the, there is no perfusion, we don't, don't need FFA there. The octa su suffice our purpose. So this is my last indication, the vasculitis. The vasculitis is basically a peripheral disease. So in a peripheral disease, you will need a peripheral scans. So octa per se, the present day octa machines do not help us in that. But if you have a, a machine like, uh, the, 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 which is uh, again given by the same colleague that uh, which uh, you can make a montage there. So octa is able to pick the capillary non-perfusion, which is, looks similar to the FFA. So yes, the future of octa is there in, in, in cases of uh, vasculitis. To summarize in present day, the role of FFA has come down and with the OCT, but it has further come down with the use of uh, Octa there. And uh, the, the limitations, you all know, the remains the, the artifacts because of the longer duration of the patient which I have to fix. And of course, the, the field of view is always welcome. We will we'll all want Octa from pole to pole. And that will be the best thing to happen to the, uh, I think, retina practice. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, so, for showing us such beautiful clinical cases. Oh. And thank you for the insight into diabetic retinopathy and our uh, and venous occlusion. So uh, now uh, I would like to invite Dr. Karthik. Dr. Karthik is a leading surgeon and, and, a, and, a, recent, and a young person from Varanasi. He's going to talk about uh, the OCT interpretation and he's going to give us the basic insight into the OCTA. How does it work and what are the artifacts in it? Thank you, sir, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to this IC. I'll just start soon. Okay, uh, so sir has already uh, talked about the clinical modes of the clinical interpretation. I'll just talk about the basics and what are the artifacts in OCTA. So first, the basics about I'll, what is OCTA does like a, it's a non-invasive technique for imaging the retina and choroid neovascular. And uh, OCTA technology uses laser and light reflectance of the surface of moving red blood cells and to detect uh, depict the vessel through the different segmented area of eye accurately. So the area of interest is scanned repeatedly over the time and then the void and all those flow voids, everything is measured and the area of significance changes between the scans 
which have a high flow rate so area with a slower or no flow will have a similarities among the different scans like you can see in the second picture there is a uh, flow void area here like so I was showing in different cases so it eliminates the need for intravascular, uh, intravascular dye for vessel visualization if you see this uh, diagram like it looks uh, like there is a foveal thinning with atrophy and loss of outer retinal layer just notice the scans over the time so you uh, if you see this uh, image you can see that there's a beautiful network here which we could have found uh, found out or you can you could have just left it but uh, just this octa octa is just a base, uh, amazing tool to uh, show these character network which are which uh, which can be even uh, missed so many time uh, on a oct scans so uh, the light source can be a spectral domain a wavelength of 800 mil, uh, nanometer or a swept source with a wavelength of 1050 a longer wavelength have a, deep, a deeper tissue penetration but a slightly slower axial resolution so what are the techniques for motion detection is speckle variance amplitude uh, decorrelation and a phase variance i'll just talk uh, basics about it uh, a speckle variance is nothing but it analyzes the amplitude fluctuation between the b scans and uh, a higher variance indi indicates the flow than the static tissue and what is uh, decorrelation amplitude decorrelation analyzes amplitude fluctuation uses correlation for uh, calculation and it does not get affected by the phase noise and what is the phase variance it detects the variation of phase of light when it intercept intercept the moving object like a ultrasound doppler more prone to the noise or what are the method to remove this background noise it can be uh, it is split spectrum amplitude decorrelation angiography what is uh, ssada or a volume averaging again the basics about ssada is it's a full oct spectrum is split into several narrower bands and then each scan becomes less susceptible to the noise so each scan is analyzed separately by the computer and then it is averaged so you get a very clear picture rather than uh, getting a picture which has a overlapping vessels or a overlapping void area so you can even calculate the area which which is there for the void and volume averaging there is several three dimensional data sets are required and then octa vo uh, volumes are averaged to get a final image OCT algorithm again the server was telling about 12, 12 cross 12 image montage 9 cross 9 6 cross 6 and 3 cross 3 segmentation is uh, classically by four zones uh, that is superficial retinal plexus like you're seeing here then a deep retinal plexus and the outer retina you're seeing the third image various devices can be uh, the first one is topcon which has a different algorithm which is OCTA ratio analysis better uh, sensitivity and reduce motion artifact the Heidelberg engineering which has a spectrally true track beam if you see the image on the side you see that there's a single beam system and the true uh, true track dual beam system where the reference scan or the cross section scan are differently uh, measured and then they are uh, analyzed and uh, the final image is given then there is a Zeiss angioplex, uh, angioplex where the tracking software is known as fast track three dimensional images obtained depicting erythrocyte flow as well as microvasculature of the superficial deep and the avascular tissue opto view angio view uses ssada and minimizes motion noise and uh, allows quantitative analysis what are the artifacts uh, these were the machines and the basics about OCT. i'll just talk a very few points about oct artifacts there can be media opacities. Media opacities lead to a lot of signal attenuation, obscures uh, portion of OCT angiogram or causes a diffuse reduction of image quality. It reduces the vessel density. Maybe uh, different in the different model of OCT machine, but it needs, uh, like once you start using a machine, uh, you need to analyze the image over time and then you can actually reduce these uh, media opacities or you can even try to uh, figure out what uh, what how to take the scan or how to shift the machine to get a better scan avoiding the media obesity our projection or artifact inevitable most prominent and uh, important artifact deeper layer reflect backlight and move past the blood vessels and it causes the impression of vascular layer on the deeper layer like similar to the superficial vascular layers so uh, method to minimize this is like slab subtraction projection artifact uh, removal algorithm and three dimensional projection artifact removal algorithm 
I'll not just talk about details about all these things because it's a it's a very big topic in itself. But it's just uh, just uh, some methods to know how we can do it. And uh, technological innovation has actually reduced a lot of projection artifact removal. And there is a compensation method which are not perfect, nor they are very uniform across OCTA devices. Segmentation error can be there. Like uh, uh, so many times, you get an image where uh, where you will not be seeing a very beautiful uh, network as you see in uh, see sometimes. So what what is there? It actually, there is a limited a limitation of segmentation. Machine does a very good do job most of the time, but there can be some time limitation of that also. Like uh, example in the PED cases, careful examination when, uh, with the segmentation can reveal a beautiful network rather than just a machine giving on its own. Like you see here in this image, uh, if you see this area, the network is not actually seen very nicely. And uh, if you if you do a manual segmentation with the layer by layer uh, segmentation, you will find that okay, th there was a even bigger network which we see on the image here. There can be so a shadowing artifact. Shadowing artifact is like uh, the OCT being uh, beam is blocked and cannot reach the outer retinal layer. There can be drusen, there can be hemorrhage, there can be vitreous floater, or a significant retinal edema can also cause shadowing artifact. Uh, light is reflected back from these structural aberration and does not penetrate the underlying tissue. Area below these features appear as a flow void area. So see this diagram and uh, see this arrow which I am pointing here. There is a, a shadowing artifact because of the scar here. See this, there is a significant retinal edema and you see those, those scans here on the uh, below section. You are not seeing anything uh, useful here. So this is also one of the shadowing artifact. Dr. Karthik, time. Yeah, just I'm done. So uh, again, the motion artifacts are there which uh, like I'll just, uh, there's nothing much about this to talk about. And then there's the extra vascular signals where you can, where exudate and transudate macular edema can be there. And there, at, uh, in the exudate, proteinaceous particles are suspended in the fluid. The po uh, motion of this particle causes extra vascular artifacts. And uh, that's all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karateke, uh, such a beautiful insight into the artifacts that are seen in OCT NGO. I just like to add one thing that OCT NGO, the segmentation is more most important. So segmentation is, error is something that cannot be corrected by the machine itself. Anyway, now we, I'm going to talk. Uh, go and move to the sec the third talk of the day. That is the, how OCT is helpful in diagnosing PCV and a newer term that is non-exudative uh, MNVs. I would like to invite Dr. Bhuvan, who is as of now working in Bharti Hospital, Delhi, and has a lot of research work on OCT NGO. They do. So, uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ankur and AIOS for including me in this session. And I think we have already spoken about the the, the utilities of Okta. And uh, I'll just be highlighting what is its role in PCV. I don't know whether it will really help in diagnosing a PCV, but what is its role in PCV and in non-exudative uh, non uh, macular neovascularizations. So, uh, pachycoroid now is a term which has recently come up and it just implies that there is a diffuse choroidal thickening with dilated outer vessels and uh, or a focal choroidal thickening and there is thinning of the inner choroidal layers that is the choriocapillaries. So, it is a group of retinal disorders which uh, include the pigment epitheliopathy, uh, central serous chorioretinopathy leading to neovascularization which we known as PNV and then PCV that is polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So ICG was the gold standard for seeing the presence of polyps for the it shows hyperpermeability hyperpermeability in the choroidal vessels as well as it also shows the presence of polyps as a hyperfluorescent uh, hyperfluorescent hotspots which may be sometimes surrounded by a halo of hyperfluorescence. And this can also be seen in the presence of a subretinal bleed. So as I just mentioned, so ICG was the gold standard. So whether now Okta is able to replace ICG or not for the detection of polyps is what I'll just be discuss in the next few minutes. So now the next thing is OCT. 
so oct also uh, uh, sd oct or ss oct in a cross sectional image is sometimes very helpful in diagnosing a polyp with studies have shown that they have got a sensitivity of more than 90% however the problem is the specificity is very less is around 70 to 75% so these are very typical pictures if you have got a tall peaked pd a thumb uh, sign of the pd or there is a double notched pd or a large pd then probably it is associated with a uh, polyp which will be seen on icg and the sensitivity as i said is 90% so now just coming to octa how will octa help up uh, help us so this was a study in which you can see that there is presence of a orange lesion this presence of exudates we know on a fundus picture <coughs> <coughs> sorry a polyp will usually see will be seen as a orange lesion there will be absence of drusens so correspondingly uh, there is a icg picture which is shown and there is presence of this hyperfluorescent uh, hot spot which is corresponding to the icg so most of these studies have been done retrospectively to see whether octa was able to see these polyps or not so when we did uh, did a oct so it can show that uh, this is uh, again a, a large pd which in which a dome shaped pd in which there is a notch so the probability of having uh, a detection on oct is quite high so the same patient an octa was done so you can see this is the polyp and this is the neovascular membrane if we compare it to the icg so in a polyp the blood flow is usually less there is a hypoflow so what happens is it results in the formation of a circle or a inner circle so this is how a polyp if you are able to see on a nfa society will be seen so i don't think this is a very accurate way or a very gold standard to predict to pick up a polyp as a primary diagnosis as i said most of these are done retrospectively so as we can see the flow signal and this is a half circle which has been formed and this is how a polyp will be seen as a half circle or a full circle and however oct uh, is a very good uh, instrument for picking up the presence of these uh, branched vascular networks which can be seen so again in a octa if we do a cross sectional octa in this octa so these yellow lesions this in the in the dls sign which is the double layer sign this signifies the presence of a choroidal neovascular membrane and this signifies the presence of a polyp so if you are doing a octa a cross sectional octa may still be a better way to pick up a polyp rather than a n phase oct so in n, n phase we'll just have this white pattern which may be which may be a half circle or a full circle because of the hypoflow however if you do a cross sectional oct these these uh, this red arrow which points to these these yellow lesions just below the pd will corroborate to the uh the presence of the polyps so again it's very difficult you have to be you have to spend a lot of time if you really want to pick a polyp on a octa so this is another uh, case in which uh, we are just comparing the polyps with different vascular patterns which are seen on an octa on an face octa so as we can see this is the icg picture and if we compare it this is again we can see there is because of the hypoflow this red dotted enclosure corresponds to the presence of the polyp on a octa so this is again another icg picture in which uh, the signals of the uh, uh, polyps can be seen in this red enclosed uh, uh, dot there is no well defined vascular pattern but however there is presence of hyperfluorescence within the polyps so these are the various patterns in which you can see a polyp the other polyps is there is a there is a cluster of high flow signals so this is again a cluster of polyps so here you will see a cluster of white dots it may present as a half circle or as a full circle or as hyperfluorescent dots but again i'm saying all these studies and all what i have done are all retrospective so just seeing this pattern on a octa and saying that this is a polyp is sometimes very difficult so it cannot sometimes it cannot detect the flow signal at the polyp because it's very slow as it can be seen in this picture if there was a subretinal bleed a polyp could be seen here but since the blood flow is very slow and because of the subretinal bleed an octa could not pick a polyp which should have been picked up at this spot so just to say i think to the limitation is here the because of the slow velocity of the blood flow on octa so presently i don't think octa is the gold standard or can be used for detection of a pcv but definitely it has a role because it increases the specificity if we do a oct we have a pd we have a high sub, uh, uh, suspicion and we do a octa cross sectional octa through the pd then probably the specificity of detecting a polyp will also highly increase slow uh, since i just also said the flow velocity at the periphery is usually is faster as compared to the center so we get these half rings or a full ring
and sometimes the these polypoidal lesions are so small that they can't be picked up on a octa lesion so just this is one of my patients i just wanted to show so this you can see as the end fundus picture there is a huge pd there is some uh, a yellowish lesion here so when i did a when i did a oct there was there was a large pd which is present so i need some time if it is there it's okay yeah so these so the, this is the limitation in the octa i can see a double layer sign there i can see a large pd but however on the octa nothing is well defined here you know this, this, again i'm just saying this is this probably is a half circle this could be the polyp so once i did the icg you can see i can see that there is a pd and at the edge of the pd there are a cluster of polyps there is a, uh, a neovascular membrane which is also there so just to conclude i'll just go a bit faster now so icg is the gold standard for the polyps now coming to non exudative mnv this is a newer ter terminology this is usually the fellow eye of an eye which have got a exudative uh, neovascular membrane so there is no evidence of macular fluid on oct or on leakage on fa so this is a definition of a non exudative mnv that there is no evidence of macular fluid but however there is a hot spot on fa or icg so this is a asymptomatic condition it is usually present in the fellow eye the incidence of exudation range from 20 to 40% so as long as there is no exudation there is no need to treat it so it is a precursor to the formation of exudative uh, neovascular amd so octa is a very useful thing in this in this they since octa is a non invasive procedure you can just do an octa you in the fellow eye you many times you will see this uh, uh, this uh, avn which is there and it does not need any treatment so octa is a very effective tool for seeing these uh, uh, abnormal vascular patterns so if we compare it to oct just uh, in a oct also you will see the double layer sign which also uh, collaborates to a cnvm but the sensitivity as i said is low however with octa we can see the vascular pattern and we can always uh, follow it so again uh, this is a, a, a study which was done in which the octa was done for a non exudative mnv over a period of time and as we can see the exudation eventually occurred at 13 months which was treated again and again the exudation repeated at 29 and 33 months so octa is a very important tool not only to diagnose but also for the monitoring of these non exudative mnvs so this is another patient which remained stable over a period of 24 months and did not need any treatment since there was no exudation so just the implications octa studies have shown that large mnv com uh, complexes do not disappear with any treatment they are already mature so they don't need any treatment and also there is an uh, there is a there are few studies which say that probably these non exudative mnvs also prevent geographical atrophy so the my last slide so multimodal imaging has really uh, improved our understanding of pcvs octa is a non invasive tool but however it will not show the polyps as clear as icg so icg still remains the gold standard for pcv it helps in the uh, detection and analysis of occult cnvms which a term which was used uh, initially or non exudative mnvs and we can early detect these and we can follow up them uh, since there are chances of exudation we'll treat them only when a symptoms occurs or exudation occurs so there are no clinical trials that have been performed any definitive recommendations regarding the treatment of the non exudative mnvs so uh, thank you for your attention everyone <laughs> thank you dr bhuvan uh, now i would like to invite dr uh, pradeep who is going to talk about macular insight and importance of wild field octa colonel pradeep is right now working in uh, research and reference institute delhi he is known for his you know most um, uh, magnificent surgeries that he does in arana good morning everyone thank you for joining us early in the morning generally you expect the hall to be empty but we are extremely thankful for our audience so coming to the point uh, let me talk about macular retinal tcr type 2 it's a bilateral peripheral retinal neurodegenerative and vascular disease so here we are dealing with a condition which is both neurodegenerative and in its later stages presents with few vascular signs so the chief pathology is muller cell loss presents in the yeah. ear aged at 5 to 7 decade and that is where the picture becomes confusing that one has to differentiate it from age related macular degeneration and a large part of this particular disease occurs in diabetic patient where you have to differentiate it from the diabetic retinopathy changes too the deep capillary plexus is the one which is mainly occur in both the inner and outer retinal components resulting in photoreceptor layer atrophy rpe clumping 
and aberrant neovascular complexes. So there are a lot of differentials to MACTIL2 and I'll come straight to the point that why OCT angiography became so important in macular tail injectasia. Because what we were seeing on OCT were simply few hyperreflective spots on the temporal part of the field. Which but when we started looking at the OCT angiography images in the deep capillary plexus, we started seeing definitive signs of MACTIL. So this is what a normal octa looks like. One has to appreciate that there is an absolute symmetry both on the superior and the inferior half of the superficial and deep capillary plexus passing through the fovea. And the published evidence on MACTIL tells us that when we are looking at the superficial capillary plexus layer, one sees a lot of dropout changes and few dilatations which are more temporally compared to nasally. But the main changes occur in the deep capillary plexus where you see vascular dilatation and these beautiful telangiectasias. And it has been said that they are concentrated temporally in the superficial capillary plexus only. But when you go to the deep capillary plexus, these changes occur symmetrically around a ring around the fovea. And this is where you can appreciate that the yellow arrows in the upper slide show the superficial capillary plexus changes temporally, while the lower ones show a more circumferential kind of affliction. And as of 2022, we have seen these beautiful images of the late stages. Mind you, these are the late stages of MACTEL, where you find a lot of superficial as well as deep capillary plexus changes as dilatation. Now coming to few of our cases. This is a case where you see in the OCT, you see a small space on the temporal aspect of the fovea. Now you may wonder that what this particular space may be and ophthalmoscopy as of today is not resorted to by most of the specialists usually in the clinic. Once you go towards the OCT angiography, this is something which if it is available on your console right away, you are able to appreciate on the temporal part in the deep capillary plexus, there is an increased spacing between the vessels. Few of the vessels are dilated and here becomes a corroborative evidence for you to call it a macular telangiectasia. The important point is that you should be able to see similar changes in the fellow eye. In the fellow eye also, we saw these small two spaces towards both ends of fovea and when you looked at the octa images, the diagnosis was clinched. Now coming to the late non-proliferative stages, these are the ones where ophthalmoscopically also you start seeing a little bit of clumping of RPE and these kind of outer retinal cavitations. And again, now here you see in the deep capillary plexus in the middle of my slide, on the inferior part of the foveal vascular zone, you are seeing those beautiful dilatations. This is where the diagnosis becomes very simple using an OCD angiography. And coming to the late non-proliferative stages, one can see here that these changes progress with time and sometimes even when the OCT does not show cavitary changes or RPE defects, you are able to appreciate these kind of vascular dilatation and torch osteos. Lastly, I'll talk about the proliferative stage. So you see this kind of OCT and you find, I'm extremely sorry the slides jumped in. And you find that the deep capillary plexus shows you classical changes of MACTIL, while the outer retina shows you early proliferative changes, which can be seen as these hyperreflective shadows. The MACTIL can occur along with an associated active CNBM, as in this case. But not everything which is bulbous is a MACTIL. Here we are seeing a classical case of diabetic retinopathy where this kind of bulbous change occurred simply because of capillary dropout and a reflex angiogenesis that was occurring. Talking about the differential, this is our published work. CSC can occur along with macular telangiectasia. So you saw a patient with 20-60 vision in right eye and 20-40 vision in the left eye. You saw the right angle dipping venules. You saw few PEDs around the fovea. And the OCT tells you a mixed picture that whether, as Dr. Bowman was saying, it's a PCV or it's a CSC. But once you do the OCT angiography, you are clearly able to see that there are no BVNs here. 
and the changes of MACTL are lying alone. So here we came to a diagnosis of CSC with MACTL in this case. The deep capillary changes were much more prominent. Coming to the second case of a polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy occurring along with MACTL. These were the cases where you saw in the OCT angiography the BVNs. Then there was another case where we saw an acute CSC along with maculatal injectasia. If you look at the OCT, on the left hand side you can see the classical cavitary changes while on the right hand side you can see a thinning of the fovea. The OCT angiography slides clearly show you that there was a lot of deep capillary plexus dilatations and they gave you a diagnosis of MACTL. In a case of CDME, you might sometimes get confused when you see this kind of appearance of deep capillary plexus where the interspersed spaces are increasing but there are no actual dilatations. Similar feature can occur in a post-RBO macular edema where again you might see increased hyperreflectance on the OCTA deep capillary plexus images. But try to see that they are not symmetrical along the foveal superior and inferior axis. So this is one hint which tells you that we are not dealing with a case of MACTL. I will come to my slides on wide field octa for the sake of time. So why we require wide field OCTA? It's a non-invasive modality. It can be frequently repeated and there are no contraindications to it like comorbidities of renal failure and no dye allergy exists. So it is important to form a diagnosis, especially important in CNVMs, especially the inflammatory CNVMs and CNVMs occurring over choroidal ruptures where the OCT alone will not be able to guide you towards a hyperreflective layer which you will presume to be a CNVM. In MACTL2, there has only been a recent evidence towards the use of wide field octa and it is extremely important in my practice in cases of vaso-occlusive vasculitis. It also helps you in therapeutic decision making where when you see large CNP areas, you can add on laser and vice versa. This was already spoken by Dr. Ramandeep and it helps you in visual prognostication where you are able to see the foveal vascular zone health and if you see capillary dropout areas towards the periphery, you can correlate that well with permanent scotomas you see in the visual field of the patient. And most importantly, it is an amazing educational tool for patients where you can actually motivate them to go for therapy. This is how a 3mm scan looks and this is how a 9mm scan looks. And you can see non-ischemic CRVO patient here, uh, STBRVO patient here. And this is my favorite, a retinal vasculitis patient where the macula is getting threatened. And these are the patients where we are actually able to make a difference to the patient's life. Once you see this kind of invasion occurring towards the macula, you are immediately able to guide the patient toward either IV methylprednisolone or a pulse IV cyclophosphamide and able to save the vision of the patient. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry, I had to hurry up with my presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pradeep. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Anirudh. He has been a faculty in PGI. Now he's working as a faculty in Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. He's known for his surgical expertise and his you know, published research in the most eminent journals. He's going to talk about uh, the posture uveitis and octa. Very good morning and thank you Dr. Ankur for this opportunity. So I'll be just talking briefly about imaging of the choroid in non-infectious uveitis and how we can use OCT angio to, to uh, diagnose uh, several diseases. So we know that uh, if you have a patient in the clinic faced with such a problem, where you have a yellow lesion in the periphery, sometimes the diagnosis is quite straightforward if you have a background of the patient. So this is a patient who has disseminated tuberculosis, and so you don't really need multiple imaging. Just a fundus photograph and fluorescein may be sufficient to tell you that this is a tubercle. So this is a choroidal tubercle which appears like a gray-white lesion with a central core and this is typically seen in patients with miliary disease. But the first part that is multifocal choroiditis, that could be confusing in our clinics because you could have a patient with uh, different phenotypes such as MPE, multifocal choroiditis or those that don't resemble uh, tubercular choroiditis. So let's see, this is another spectrum of choroidal involvement in TB where you have a patient with a lot of fluid in the center 
and you have a yellowish lesion right below the macula. <coughs> Sorry. So right below the macula. When you do a fluorescein, you will realize that there is initial hypo followed by intense hyperfluorescence and pooling of the dye. Now in this, in this uh, the patient, there is no doubt that the diagnosis is TB given the uh, you know, positive labs. And of course the imaging plays a very important role compared to this patient here who has dull yellow lesions in the center. There are multiple lobulated lesions which are dull yellow. And if you see the fluorescein, you have a CME, but you have early hypo and the ICG shows you a geographic hypofluorescence. So over here, if you carefully look at the ICG, you will realize that you have multiple satellite lesions. Around the main lesion, you have multiple satellite hypo lesions. And if you look at the OCT, you have a choroidal elevation and a bump, and you have subretinal fluid. And this is a patient with sarcoid. So essentially the difference here that you can see is patients with TB will have an intense yellow lesion, lots of fluid, and sometimes neovascularization. So sometimes they present with blood vessels dipping into the lesion. Whereas sarcoid lesions are typically dull yellow, they may be multiple lobulated, and they may have less amount of fluid, less amount of neovascularization. So talking about choroidal granulomas, we know that TB granulomas are a challenge when they come to our clinics because they could be confused with metastasis or uh, masses or even subretinal abscesses. Subretinal abscess is a situation where you have a lot of exudation, necrosis, and tissue destruction. Uh, we did some work on uh, differentiating between TB and sarcoid granulomas. And you can see here that EDI-OCT is very useful in following up of these choroidal granulomas. So this is a patient, for example, who has calcified lymph nodes. And you see the choroidal granuloma is quite well behaved. So it is there in the choroid. It's not causing a lot of uh, choroidal elevation. Minimum fluid, actually no fluid here. And this is a patient with sarcoidosis. So EDI-OCT can be used to longitudinally follow up these patients. And you can see here that with treatment, there is a decrease in the anteroposterior extent of the lesion itself. So there are multiple differences between TB and sarcoid choroidal granulomas. And uh, one of them is, of course, the shape of the granulomas and the location and the color. Now, really, we found that the color of the granulomas is quite uh, suggestive of TB versus sarcoid. And of course, the other OCT parameters such as fluid, uh, new vascularization and even uh, thickness of the choroid, so the involvement. So sarcoid granulomas are usually partial thickness, whereas TB granulomas are usually full thickness. And you will also see this outer retinal infiltration in patients with TB. Now this outer retinal infiltration is quite characteristic of a TB granuloma. You will not see this in sarcoid granulomas. And now with this we are, we are starting to even quantify ICG images using third party software. Already choroidal uh, uh, vascularity index, a lot of work has been done on this. So using these uh, parameters, we can actually quantify the amount of inflammation and the lesions that are going on in the choroid. Coming back again, the top panel shows you a patient of TB where you have a large choroidal granuloma, intense yellow. Whereas on the bottom you see on the ICG, multiple round to oval uh, lesions, and this represents sarcoidosis. This is another OCT of a patient with sarcoid, well-behaved granuloma under the RPE without causing much of a bump. So I'm going to come to um, some white dot syndromes. So this is a patient who has a placoid lesion um, on the ICG and the OCT shows you ellipsoid zone disruption and photoreceptor disruption. So this is a placoid lesion which is hypo to hypo. And if you look at the OCT NGO, it exactly co-localizes with the ICG. So this is showing you a choriocapillaritis, okay, and there is no signal loss over here. So this is a true capillary void area that you can see. So this is a placoid pattern of uh, choriocapillaries flow deficit, which is seen in MPE. Now this is another patient, which is a totally different ball game. It's MUDES. Uh, this is a patient with multiple hypo lesions on ICG. And you can see that the lesions are hypo to hypo. Sometimes they're ISO to begin with, but they eventually go hypo. And if you look at the OCT, it's quite characteristic where you have sort of a disruption of the ellipsoid and the outer um, retinal layer up to the outer nuclear layer and an intact RPE. So the thing to note here is that the choreocapillaries and the RPE is completely intact. So if you compare ICG and OCT NGO at the same location, you will realize that there is nothing on the OCT NGO. So this is a very important differentiating point between MUDES and MPE. So no alteration. And finally, I'll just end with this case where you have a patient uh, with scotomas and you, you find that this is a white dot syndrome. 
and you will do uh, two types of autofluorescence. So on spectralis, you have a blue peak autofluorescence and you have a near infrared autofluorescence. So you can see the differences. On blue peak, it is quite hyper, whereas it is hypo on near infrared. The moment you have this kind of a contrasting finding, you know that this is mutes. And if you do OCTA, you will find nothing on the OCTA. So OCTA in mutes shows intact choreocapillaries. So I think I, with this, I will stop and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anil. Uh, just one question from my side. Uh, how do we follow the patient of VKH on OCT NGO? Uh, so uh, you can uh, do a baseline image. If the fluid is not so much, you can get a decent OCT NGO. And you will see, uh, maybe I can quickly show you. If you can just project the slide, please. If you can just project the slide, please. I'll just show you a, cl a classic example here of an OCT NGO in VKH. So this is a patient of VKH. You have these studied granulomas. This is how it look like on OCT NGO. So you'll have these multiple hypolesions. And the moment you do a follow-up, you can see that these hypolesions are actually decreasing in size. But what is interesting is one panel over here where you have slight increase. If you see the corner image over here, there is a slight increase in the, in the amount of hypo areas. So this is when we reduce the corticosteroids in this patient. And so OCT angio is very sensitive in showing you how the, le the disease can worsen once you decrease your steroids. Fine. Uh, thank you. And I think also the, you know, the other eye which is yet to get involved so in the subclinical yeah. cases, these, uh, these hypo areas can also tell us that this is the eye which is also getting involved. So yes. subclinical cases can also be identified on <laughs> that this. That is true. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anirudhu. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that brings me down to the last talk of the day. Uh, so now, uh, should have been the earlier slides, but now uh, let's, let's keep it to the last. So what are the jaggerons in the OCT and and how do we use OCT in research? So the what is OCT has already been covered. So what is NFAS? NFAS is nothing, but you know we have been talking about NFAS. NFAS is nothing, but the 2D representation of the 3D volumetric data that has been provided by the OCT. And every NFAS is taken at a particular segment or a slab, which is known as segmentation slab. Then there are flow signals. Flow signals represents that the vascularity of the, uh, the of the retina or the choroid. And these are the flow signals which are overlaid on the uh, structural OCT. So <laughs> like any other investigative mod modality, OCT NGO has quantifiable param parameters, one of which is perfusion density, that is total vascular area. So how is it calculated? So any image of OCT and you undergoes uh, processing in the machine or can be processed in other softwares. The processing happens that these images are com converted to binarized images. What does binarized mean? Binarized means black and white. So in the black and white images, the the white represents the vessels and the white areas can be, the white pixels can be calculated from that area and that represents the total vascular area. Now, uh, these binarized images are further skeletonized. What does skeletonized mean? That is, this is the skeleton of those vessels. So in this, the, all the vessels have the almost the same area, the bigger or the small vessels. So this is the vessel density. And then there is something known as blood vessel tortuosity. So it is the ratio between the geocytic distance and uh, leukidian distance. So what does that mean? That means that if we measure a vessel between the two endpoints, the shortest distance is the geocytic distance, and the if you trace this vessel over the contour of it is the leukidian distance. So the, the ratio between the two is going to tell us how tortuous the vessel is on OCT NGO. So the uh, difference between the ratio between the uh, the binarized image and the skeletal, uh, skeletonized image can help us to uh, uh, to know the vessel diameter. And then there's another important index which is known as vessel perimetry index. This is the amount of pixels around the vessels compared to the total vascular area. And now we have uh, quantifiable, vari uh, quantifiable variables for fovea. One of them is FAG. For Villa vascular zone for FD300. FD300 is vessel density around the 300 microns of the foveal A vascular zone. Then there is extra foveal A vascular area, which is the A vascular area are outside one millimeter diameter center of the fovea. So you draw a circle on the center of the fovea of one, one mm, and any A vascular area outside that is extra, extra foveal A vascular area. 
then there are flow areas flow area you can you can you can manually draw a you can draw a circle or it the machine will draw a circle and at the same time you can draw a particular area and you see how many vessels are there the vessel density is the flow area so uh, no, unlike uh, like uh, uh, unlike oct uh, like oct is also not devoid for you know errors so they are confounding factors that affect the oct calculation the the quanti the quantitative analysis is also confounded by these errors so because there is a lack of normative data there is inter individual variations age variations axial length can also affect the lateral magnification of the octa so what it means is shorter axial length the oct scans area is smaller while in myopia it is larger so smaller area would mean that fz occupies a larger portion and the of the scan area resulting in error erroneously lower vessel density so then how do we deal with it we deal with it with some uh, parameters which are not affected by confounding one of which is a circularity index so a circularity index is the ratio of the perimetry of the foveolar vascular zone to the perimeter of the circle of the same amount of the area and this is one one variable which is not affected by the axial length or the you know the magnification of the octa or, or magnification magnification happening by the octa a perfect particularly circular fz has an a circularity index of 1 deviation from the circular shape of the fz will lead to increase in this matrix then there is uh, radial peripapillary capillary vessel density it is nothing but a vessel density around the disc and usually calculated in an in an in between the two circles which can vary in diameter depending on the type of the machines so why do we need the assessment rakowski and et al has suggested that ft300 is a sensitive biomarker to differentiate or to recognize the patients who is going to have a diabetic retinopathy while extra foveal extra foveal avascular area in the superficial capillary plexus can discriminate between uh, between uh, a non diabetic retinopathy from npdr vessel density in the dcp can help us to distinguish between the npdr and those from pdr while as the disease progresses the peripapillary rpc perfu perfusion decreases with time so then there are quantitative parameters how do we, well, the quantitative parameters that can be used in sickle cell retinopathy one of which is a circularity index so a circularity in a circularity index and a vascular density a vascular density that is extra foveal avascular area in the temporal region of superficial capillary plexus apart from that the we know that the vessels are dilated in sickle cell so you know dilated vessels or increased diameter in the sickle cell disease can would be one parameter apart from that is increased toxicity which is bvt blood vessel toxicity which is increased in patients with sickle cell disease so uh, oct and can uh, can be can also help us to assess the progression of the uh, glaucoma it can act as a pre perimetric test but to understand one thing which is important is that the peripapillary microvascular uh, reduction is consequential to rnfl thinning and it's not the other way so uh, oct and can also be used to look at diseases like alzheimers mild cognitive impairment and multiple sclerosis by measuring the rpc vessel density so you know there was a lack of standardization so we need something to standardize the oct and geo so every machine had a different parameters and a different uh, different ways to calculate it so this is an open octava is an open source validated standardized software toolbox that allow us to calculate the vessel density the vessel length average distribution of the vessel di diameter average and distribution of the vessel length vessel toxicity and fractal dimension so what are the future prospects with all the parameters we have one is that these machine with the help of the ai can automatically identify these flow void area which dr andrew talked about and you can you know they can track uh uh in in a distant area that the disease is getting re reduced so uh, the pay, the machine can give you a red sign when the disease is further progressing so that can be used apart from that fractal dimension measurement along with the structural quantitative parameters can be used for progress progression analysis in armd uh, oct ngo you know wide field oct ngo with these parameters in place can also identify the cases where we are going to have these the way, the way these cases are going to progress to and uh, the development of uh, ischemic crvo apart from that progression analysis can also help us to tell apart from ocd injury can also help us to tell that these are the patients which will develop nvg in later course of life 
थैंक यू सो एनी क्वेश्चन फॉर एनी ऑफ द स्पीकर वी कैन टेक क्वेश्चन आई थिंक वी हैव अराउंड टू मिनट्स फॉर दैट थैंक यू